including uh, um, Army, Air Force, and Navy, what we call uh, land, air, and water resources here, uh, material science, chemistry, and probably uh, geology. And have I left any out? That's about right. That's about right. And Alex has uh, been here a uh, similar time frame to me, about the last 13 years. She came from Princeton. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And she's going to give us a half an hour presentation to kick off this session about energy with a very provocative title, Energy Applications Need Complex Adaptive Matter. Okay, so what I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, the microphone. Sorry, microphone. The microphone. Is it on? Well, this one here. is on. We've got to put it on here. You've got to put it on. Okay. Turn this one off. Yeah, turn that one off. Here's. And I'll get you a laser pointer. Probably won't use it. Okay, is that better? Make any difference? Oh, is it on? The microphone's not on. Sorry. One small detail. Oh, one small detail. Let's turn it on. Is it on now? Yes. Yes? Yeah. That's on. That's okay, on. it's on. Good. All right. So what I thought I'd do, uh, I was planning to do it after Nate, but this is okay, Alex. is to thanks. Is to talk about uh, energy, complex adaptive matter, and introduce some of the research that we're doing at Davis in the context of energy research. So of course, I want to balance general things and present a little bit of my own science, being, after all, motivated in my own science. So the talk will be split among those two topics. And let's see if this will advance. Good. So what I would like to concentrate on, in terms of Davis, is some of the efforts that we've had for a number of years and some of the new efforts. And in particular, I'd like to talk about NEAT nanomaterials in the environment, agriculture, and technology. I'd like to talk about uh, some of our new faculty. I'd like to mention the Chevron grant in energy. I'd like to talk about energy frontier research centers and a number of other efforts going on at Davis in energy. So perhaps to give you, you know, the sort of perspective of UC Davis, Davis is a very broad institution. We've got a veterinary school, we've got a medical school. We started off as the farm for UC Berkeley and we have a noble agricultural tradition that has morphed into a lot of biology of all sorts. And of course, all of these things are related to energy. Energy, environment, global warming, all of these things are interrelated. All of these things require basic science and they require uh, applied science and they require social science and they require policy. And Davis, in fact, has a number of things going on at all of these levels. So there's an institute for transportation studies that looks both at fuel cell cars and at transportation policy. There's an institute on energy efficiency and lighting, uh, et cetera. And then there's a basic science of all sorts. So when we started NEAT, Nanomaterials in the Environment, Agriculture, and Technology, which eventually became an organized research unit, which is University of California in jargon for certain organization. Uh, we thought that at the beginning of the sort of nano emphasis, that it would be very important to bring together applications of nano, not just in conventional materials technology and physics, but in chemistry, unconventional materials, environmental science, agriculture, biology, and so forth. And to a fair extent, we've had considerable success at this. We had an IGERT grant, an NSF education grant on the topic. And we have a number of moderate-sized grants of various sorts for people to work together on different topics. And indeed, one of the characteristics of NEAT is that some of the more successful parts of NEAT have actually gotten, if you will, too big for NEAT and gone off on their own. So Tony Wexler, for example, has a quality research center as a separate sort of thing. And there's a lot of environmental <coughs> nanoparticles and medical nanoparticle things that are basically going their own way outside of NEAT, although the initial discussions and ideas really came through NEAT. So NEAT is alive and well. We've had a certain amount of reorganization that we're in the middle of right now. Uh, from the point of view of ICAM and I2CAM, the NSF grant, uh, NEAT also is the administrative home for that. And although we're in the process of replacing some staff who left, those things happen, 
I expect uh, that we will have stability again in staff and we will have then stability for the next five years or four and a half years in any event because the NSF ICAM grant runs that long and we've received a number of other new grants including big pieces of two energy frontier research centers. So, uh, in fact, to talk more about energy frontier research centers, this was, in my view, a really inspired both political and scientific move of the uh, Office of Science uh, of the Department of Energy. It really grew over the last five years with a couple false starts, and it took advantage then of the increased science funding and the stimulus funding of the past uh, year. And in fact, out of about 200 proposals, something like, I believe, 46 Energy Frontier Research Centers got funded. And uh, they are centers at two to five million dollars a year in different parts of the basic science of energy. So solar energy is a lot of things. Nuclear energy is perhaps a smaller portfolio. Uh, and other parts of energy as well, biofuels, for example. And when you read through where those centers are and who the people involved in them, it, are, it really reads like a who's who of people who are well established in their fields. And I think having big collaborative research and five years of continuity in it is really going to change the face of science in terms of getting a much larger fraction of people to collaborate and to think in interdisciplinary ways. And of course, the eventual goal is to really bridge that gap from the fundamental to the applied, but this is an Office of Science program, so its emphasis is, in fact, on fundamental research, which is very good news. At Davis, we're involved in two EFRCs. Uh, one is, as it, as it turned out, they are both headed elsewhere, and frankly, having the bureaucracy elsewhere may not be a bad thing. Uh, one is called Material Science of Actinides. Peter Burns at Notre Dame is the PI on that. Rod Ewing in Michigan and I are the three major actors in it with then participation by a large number of other groups. And the idea is to look at actinide materials, uh, in our case, uranium and thorium, in Peter's case, the higher actinides as well, really as a general material science solid state chemistry question, not so much perhaps in the condensed matter physics and the fermion point of view, but really in the chemistry materials point of view. Uh, the parts that we have at Davis involves four investigators, ourselves with the Peter A. Rock Thermochemistry Laboratory and our unique thermochemical measurements for looking at the stability of various materials. Um, Bill Casey in chemistry involved in nanocluster chemistry and the actinides have a tremendously rich aqueous chemistry, cluster chemistry going into nanoparticle chemistry and a theoretical effort uh, with Mark Asta and Niels Jensen to look at uh, these materials from primarily a density functional and molecular dynamics point of view. And this overlaps with some other research as well. The second EFRC that we're participating in is headed by Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Don DePaolo, who has a joint appointment at UC Berkeley and LBL. He's a geochemist. The title is Nanoscale Controls on Geologic CO2. The idea is that if one pumps large volumes of supercritical CO2 into abandoned mines, depleted oil fields, whatever one is going to do, the major reactivity of that material is going to be at interfaces, interfaces with aqueous solutions, typically uh, brines at over 100 degrees centigrade, and with mineral surfaces. And the manner of that reactivity is really then a nanoscale complex phenomenon. And again, then the different groups are looking at uh, reactions at different scales, and we have some biological uh, ideas as well for perhaps the control of CO2 reactivity through uh, organisms and several other ideas. Both these EFRCs are then getting started. Well, what does this have to do with complex adaptive matter? My contention, very simply, 
and let's see if Nate will resonate to this in one way or another, is for a material to be active in uh, the energy environment, in transforming one form of energy to another, uh, solar energy to chemical energy or whatever, that material has to be adaptive. It has to be able to access, if you will, a broad landscape of states. It has to be tuned to get the band gap right, to get the distance over which an electron hole pair separates right, to do all of these things. And that is exactly the sort of thing that ICANN is interested in. How does structural complexity and the ability to tune materials determine their function? And working backwards, how does learning about how materials change with small changes in whatever your tuning parameters are, how does that affect the basic science? And I think we have an opportunity here to bring forward both the basic science and the uh, applied science in very exciting ways. Okay, so then these are some of the other UC Davis participations that we have. Uh, and I've talked about those a little bit already, so I think to save some time, I will go ahead to uh, some of our own research. And I'd like to have two examples from our own very recent work. One is energy landscape in calcium carbonate, particularly involving amorphous calcium carbonate. Uh, the emphasis here is CO2 sequestration, the first, if you will, steps potentially in trapping CO2 into a carbonate, but also biomineralization. Uh, many organisms use calcium carbonate rather than appetite for their hard parts, and amorphous calcium carbonate is clearly an intermediate. And the second is ordering energetic structure of fluorite-based oxides. These are nominally very simple materials, but actually they become structurally very complex. And what is interesting is that they are applicable both to nuclear energy, one talks about uranium dioxide, thorium dioxide, plutonium dioxide, or to solid oxide fuel cells if one talks about zirconia, or to gate dielectrics if one talks about hafnia, or to both solid oxide fuel cells and sort of model materials for plutonium if one talks about cerium. So the basic science really transcends the applications and though the basic science may be applications driven, it is really the same science whether one is talking about, in many cases, uh, an actinide or something else, with of course special wrinkles of oxidation state, radiation damage, various things. So, uh, the calcium carbonate case then, we have just recently determined the energetics of different calcium carbonate polymorphs. Starting on the left hand side of the slide is initially precipitated amorphous calcium carbonate, which is very hydrated and very disordered. Upon annealing, that material loses most, though not all, of its water content, still remains amorphous, and becomes energetically very similar to material that we isolated from sea urchin embryos, uh, which is the amorphous calcium carbonate that's biogenic. These materials are still very substantially metastable relative to the normal calcium carbonate crystalline polymorphs, namely batterite, which is rare, aragonite and calcite, which are common, and indeed organisms can use amorphous calcium carbonate to make either aragonite or calcite. And what this slide shows is that it is energetically downhill in any case to make those polymorphs. And the crystalline polymorphs are very similar in energy. The amorphous materials are quite metastable. And we're linking this now to the structure. And this really is then a case of uh, complex structures transforming in a number of steps. We're also looking at the surface energies of the materials, the interface energies, and the formation of prenucleation clusters in aqueous solution for which there is evidence, but we're hoping to be able to isolate such clusters and perhaps even crystallize them and see what compounds they form. So those are the sorts of things that we're involved in. Uh, so the tentative conclusions on calcium carbonate, uh, there are two forms of amorphous calcium carbonate. 
one more hydrated and less stable, one less hydrated and more stable, and the transformations are energetically downhill through a landscape of complex structures. I don't think we've even looked at all of them yet. Uh, there are additional issues. Magnesium stabilizes the amorphous phases, perhaps because of the easy and strong hydration of the magnesium ion. There's also a lot of interest in the substitution of iron, uh, both ferrous and possibly ferric, into carbonate structures. So there's a lot of work to be done. To talk about the fluorite materials, uh, simple structure for the basic materials, uh, use then in nuclear energy in solid oxide fuel cells, and gate dielectrics, and gas separation membranes, in uh, turbine coatings, all sorts of things. The basic issue is that these materials form defective structures, structures in which the oxygen, some of the oxygen can be removed from the oxide sublattice and charge compensated by a lower valence ion. So one can think of the parent fluoride structure as a set of boxes stacked, stacked outside a liquor store, empty liquor boxes is what I like to think of. Only one, every other box has something in the middle, a nice bottle of wine, nice cation, something like that. And if the cations are all tetravalent, then all the oxygen sites are filled. But if the cations are trivalent or divalent, then there's a charge balancing mechanism whereby one of the oxygen sites is empty and it's compensated, for example, by two trivalent cations. And then the question arises, does this substitution on cation and anion sublattices occur at random, or is it coupled? Does it occur as individual ionic substitution, or are the ions clustered? What is the size of the cluster? Are there ordered phases? And what is the thermodynamics? And what I would like to concentrate on right now is some new work that we've done, which relates to clustering and ionic conductivity. And we've done work in cerium systems and most recently in thorium systems. Uh, it has been known for practically a century that as you substitute, for example, more yttrium in yttrium stabilized zirconia, YSZ, the prototype ionic conductor, you would think the more yttrium you substitute, the more oxygen vacancies you have, the higher the conductivity is. But in fact, the conductivity goes through a maximum which means that when you substitute too much yttrium, somehow those oxide ions are not those oxygen vacancies, the places where the oxide ions are not, can no longer move freely through the structure. There's a lot of discussion as to what that means, both from theory and experiment. What we have found recently, over the last eight months or so, is that in both cerium-based systems and thorium-based systems, we see a very strong correlation between the maximum in ionic conductivity and a maximum in destabilization of the structure. We cannot take this easily to the yttria stabilized zirconia or hafnia case just because there are other polymorphs, monoclinic and tetragonal, that mask these effects. But in materials where the parent fluoride structure is the only structure that forms, which means cerium oxide, thorium oxide, uranium oxide, plutonium oxide for that matter. One can then see the conductivity maximum and the thermodynamics. And what we have done for several systems, two doped serious systems, is observe the correlation between a maximum in ionic conductivity and a maximum in the enthalpy of formation that is a least stable enthalpy of formation. Uh, we have another cerium based system, same business. Well, is this something peculiar with respect to cerium? We were worried at the beginning that it has to do with some trivalent cerium. We think that is not the case anymore. But nonetheless, it would be good to look at it in another system. And we have just recently completed work on thorium-based systems and uh, seen similar correlations between ionic conductivity maximum when it's measured and maximum destabilization. We think what is happening is that at the point where the conductivity goes through a maximum, one is seeing the onset of clustering of the vacancies into aggregates, into clusters, 
That is energetically favorable. It loses entropy. But it causes a maximum of the destabilization of the system. That is, there is a competition between ionic radius size effects, which destabilize isolated defects, and the clustering effects, which stabilize the clusters uh, at the, in energetically, but of course, uh, cost entropy since they are no longer randomly distributed defects. And we're trying to analyze the data to see if we can actually get some energetics of these different processes out of the thermochemical data and then correlate it with the conductivity. Now, conductivity, of course, is an activated process. So one has a mobility term as well as a vacancy concentration term. One can hand wave about the vacancy concentration term. But if, in fact, the maximum in thermodynamic destabilization of the bulk phase and the maximum in conductivity occur at the same concentration, to me, it's saying that the mobility term at least near that maximum to both sides of it, is not changing very much. Otherwise, one might get some sort of offset. Uh, we're talking with some of our modeling colleagues to see if one can do some Monte Carlo simulations to see if that is really the case, why this correlation is as strong as it is. So these materials are complex. They can be tuned. The degree of short range, or in some cases long range order, depends on composition and preparation conditions, and the uses of these materials then, again, depends on this ordering. If you're using a material for an oxide fuel cell, you want maximum conductivity. If you're using a material to store nuclear waste, or perhaps as a nuclear fuel, uh, you probably don't want too much diffusion of ions, so you perhaps are excited about having clusters in which your dopants uh, are trapped. Nuclear fuel, of course, produces lanthanides as fission products from the actinides, so lanthanide doped actinide solid solutions are very relevant to nuclear energy. So that is the sort of, uh, oh, here's the Forest system data that's gotten misplaced, again, as a maximum in the same sense. Uh, lesson learned. Uh, same scientific issues apply to different applications. One should stick with the basic scientific questions, but one should look for systems in which there is national need, national interest. I like the DOE term of use-inspired or use-driven basic research. There's no need to work on materials that are of no interest to anybody, but there is an equal need to make sure that the work that you do on materials that are currently of interest is good fundamental work. And let me just conclude again by saying that it is complexity, often at the nanoscale, so that <coughs> the ability to adapt the structure to a particular ap application that is at the crux of many of these energy applications. And if I say NEAT for the last decade has been nanomaterials in the environment, agriculture, and technology, perhaps we should put another E into NEAT. NEAT! and say it's nanomaterials in energy, environment, agriculture, and technology. So that's an overview, and after Nate's talk, we will have some specific talks by people that have come to Davis as part of NEAT and participate in it to give you some feeling of the energy-related research going on. Thanks. Maybe uh, we have Nate online actually, and I'll pull the laptop over. But uh, maybe while we um, uh, are waiting, I just had one question. Uh, so you were, you were mentioning cerium oxide, and you thought there's maybe trivalent yeah. cerium in there. Uh, and it's well known, um, and Jim Allen perhaps can comment on this, that uh, cerium oxide is uh, almost certainly quantum mechanically mixed valent cerium. And I wonder uh, what, uh, what role that could play. This was at the ionic conductivity, I believe, of the cerium oxide. With vacancies, presumably? Or? Well, our concern was that, particularly when you have a low concentration of other trivalent dopant, that the cerium oxide itself self dopes by some of the cerium, going trivalent and some oxygen basically disappearing from the structure. We've done a lot of analytical work of various sorts, and, you know, does it happen on the parts per million or parts per thousand level? We can't rule out. Does it happen on the percent level? 
no, at least not for our samples. And again, I might say that the samples that are good ionic conductors that we use are basically, you know, white to cream color to light yellow and the slightest greater reduction of the cerium uh, basically turns them dark very quickly. So, and, and we have a lot of other, quite a bit of other evidence that that is not the reason for this maximum destabilization. Which isn't to say that cerium isn't uh, multivalent in other, set, in other systems, and of course what happens in the metal is very different. Well, even in cerium oxide, I think there's a strong suspicion that it's mixed valent. But Jim, I don't know if you have any. No, I would say that CEO2 is an, an example of, of a covalently bonded uh, tetravalent cerium, uh, which is probably as close as you get unless you try yeah. a cerium chloride. There is. But yeah. I remember studying CEO2 films, yeah. and putting them in vacuum. Oh, yeah. And trying to uh, do flow emission, and you shine photons or electrons, and they say you can just watch the oxygen running out of the Oh, water, absolutely. And the valence comes to go. Absolutely. And around and in, in, in films and also in nanoparticles, there's quite a bit of evidence that in nanoparticles, the cerium is much easier to reduce. Uh, kinetically, and we are in the process of making nanomaterials and by our calorimetric measurements, try to see whether the cerium is easier to reduce thermodynamically, energetically as well at the nanoscale. And those are a bit tricky as experiments go. Are there any other questions for Alex? Well, thank you, Alex, for kicking off and being a uh, complex adaptive person, uh, <laughs> complex adaptive speaker. and. Uh, to bring Nate Lewis to you. And I hope that the same thing doesn't happen with the projector as before, which is that it grows up. But uh, hopefully this will work. Just about to start. Um, can you hear me on that side? Uh, let's see. Nate, can you hear me? You can. Okay, good. We're just about to start. Hang on a second. So Nate, what you need to do is, uh, is the microphone on on your side? Oh, I'm sorry, the speaker's not on on my side, hang on. <laughs> uh, my transmit bar is showing up clearly. That yep, you're there, you're there, we're ready to go. You want me to just start? Yes, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead and start, Nate. Yeah. 
two shot at, and our shot is right here, right now. With those fighting words, I'll tell you three different little parts of the story. The first is fact that undisputed peer-reviewed numbers about the scale of the energy per challenge. You can't solve a problem without understanding its scale, and so we need to get the ground rules right. Uh, and the next part of this, I'll tell you about why there's really such a big challenge. And then the third part, I'm going to tell you about what the laws of physics and chemistry as opposed to the laws of politics, because only the latter can be repealed, dictate the allowed solutions can actually come from. If you want, you can see a little bit longer version of this talk, a transcript, you can get presentations, almost all sorts of things on my website, which is just my initials.caltech.edu. And I'm always happy to have input and feedback, which I get a lot on this. So I'm not the only one saying this. Rick Smalley said it in Congress. Mark Lindenary News says it. Tom Friedman says it. Presidents of universities are saying it. Uh, but it's not so easy. The scale is imposing and its own challenge. In news, though, I think of the only ones the general public can understand, not barrels of oil equivalent or short tons of coal or ETU or something like that. But they all know what watt is. A laptop is a few watts. A toaster, when it's on, is about a kilowatt. A small jet engine is about a thermal megawatt. The output of a typically sized, weighted for safety purposes to combine the heat and neutron fluxes in known materials is about a gigawatt electric output of a typically sized, once through nuclear fission plant. And a thousand times greater than that is the electric average power consumption of the world, which I'm sure this audience appreciates that that photo wasn't all taken at once. But I do have to explain that phenomenon to a lot of people. Even this one terawatt of average electricity should not be confused with the total energy consumption because supplied electricity is only a fraction of total primary energy consumed. If you add that up, oh, look at that. We have lost some in translation, but the bottom line is the same. I don't know why this isn't showing up, but I'll tell you what's on these charts, and hopefully it will still work. If you have all the joules consumed of primary energy in a year, divide by the number of seconds in a year, in 2001, the average rate of energy consumption was about 13 terawatts. It's now pushing almost 15 terawatts. The United States consumes a quarter of the world's energy, but we won't talk any more about that because this is inherently a global problem. Sure, national security and energy security figure into a geopolitical debate, but you know, if we ever start to run out of oil, we already know what happens. Humans have already fought wars over natural resources. There's no indication the future would be any different than the past. We'll just continue to go get whatever fossil energy there is, if it's the choice of that or the lights going out. The bar chart showed you that 85% of current energy supply is the fossil energy is roughly equal parts oil, coal, and gas. A little bit is hydroelectricity. Uh, renewables accounts for two tenths out of the 13, and nuclear power currently accounts for 0.9 out of the 13. But that's the thermal load of nuclear generated heat. Only 0.3 terawatts of electricity is generated from that heat content of current nuclear power. So maybe that will change. Actually, I hope not all these charts have. Uh, So I don't really know what to do about that at this point since we didn't check that that was going to be an issue. Um, Nate, uh, I can Nate, continue. Nate, excuse me. Uh, I can show the, I have the PowerPoint loaded, so on those ones that are missing, I'll just pull them up on the PowerPoint. Why don't you do that? Okay. And I'll just tell you, 
you can slide. Tell me when to change the slide. Good. So right now you're on energy reserves and resources. I'll go ahead and go to that.
two other conventional factors. One is economic growth. Because after all, if we didn't connect by the internet and drive cars and go to work and just lived in caves, we wouldn't use much energy. And per capita, gross domestic product has been growing historically over the last century at 1.6% per year. And in business as usual, in this scenario, in 1992, the IPCC said, well, we believe that this scenario will have the same growth rate globally for the next 40, 50 years as what we've seen for the last 100. And so they projected 1.6% per year. Now, let me remind you that the developed countries claim that they want 3 or 4% economic growth. That nobody in 1992 could have foreseen the sustained double-digit growth of China and India. That as we painfully see today, no country has a policy against economic growth. And so it's doubtful this number will stay negative for very long. And in most quarters, 1.6% is near recession level. If the number gets bigger, the situation only gets worse. So whether it's 1 or 2% doesn't matter. We'll go with that number, 1.6%. Now, due to the magic of compound interest, these two things, population growth and economic growth, unmitigated would lead to a tripling of energy demand by 2050 relative to 1990 levels. But in fact, it's partially mitigated by the fact that energy consumption per unit of GDP has been declining at a rate of about 1% per year. Because we're using energy more efficiently, and that's the historical average. Now the United States is actually saving energy at twice that rate, 2% per year. And so, ironically, our policy is that we will continue to show the rest of the world how to save energy. But we can only do that because...